The next argument <clears throat> is in the Gospel of John, you know, when the Jews were stoning him, they, they said, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So the Jews in the Gospel of John, um, they, uh, they were trying to basically incriminate Jesus for blasphemy. So they were asking him difficult questions, and when he was answering the questions, they were trying to put him in a corner, and then they were saying, see, you're a man, but you're claiming to be God. Now look at, now to answer this, so the Christian will tell you, see, even the Jews recognize that he was trying to say he's God. Why are you, why are you uh, not recognizing this? So we'll say, just look at Jesus' response to them. Jesus, so now they said, you are claiming to be God. So Jesus could have said, yes, I am. Or he could have said, no, I'm not. Right? But look at what he says. He said, is it not written in your law? I have said, you are God's. If he calls them God, so now Jesus quotes the Old Testament to them. And in the Old Testament, it says that, it, it tells the Israelites that you are gods. Because they were judging over people. So in that sense, because they had the right to judge over people. So they were called gods in inverted commas. So the Jews are, are, are accusing Jesus and saying, you claiming to be God. So Jesus said, in your own Old Testament, it calls, you know, the, the, the Israelite judges, it calls them gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? So Jesus is saying, if you could call them gods in inverted commas just because they were judges, what about me? I am the selected prophet of God. This mean, And obviously we understand from this that he doesn't mean the divine father who you worship. He's got nothing to do with that. Go, and you'll, you'll see this also throughout the Old Testament where the, God, where, where the Lord says to Moses, you are a god to your people. It just means that they have to obey you. So again, this, this play on word, these plays on words which happen is sometimes used by the Christian to take it out of context. But if you read the response of Jesus, it's quite clear that he's not talking about being worshipped or being equal to the Father. So that's another. Now the perhaps the strongest proof that they will bring is the, the concept of the logos or the word. So if you read the, the beginning of John, chapter number one, verse number one, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So, right. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. Now, before we even get into this, how could an uneducated disciple named John who was a fisherman write this? This is, a, this is very complex Greek philosophy taken from Philo of Alexandria. We'll talk about this just now was a Jewish Greek philosopher. This is taken from him almost word for word, the beginning part. So it's very clear that this was not written by a disciple of Jesus. You know, that's, that's the thing we need to understand. The Gospel of John was not uh, written by, by, by a disciple of Jesus. So definitely we don't accept every word. Now, according to this Gospel, is Jesus is saying these words? Are these the words of Jesus? No, it's the words of the author of the Gospel of John. He is saying this from his own side. So does that hold any weight in our eyes? A random person writing in the year 100 saying this, does it hold any weight in our eyes? Those, you can't build your religious belief off that, right? And so here, if you were to accept that whatever was in the Gospels were true, you'll have a big problem. Because look at what he's saying. He's saying in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And people tried to make all sorts of interpretations for this. They tried to show that the first God is the real God, and the second one is just, you know, God in the metaphorical sense. But the easiest way to understand this and to respond to this is these are the words of a random Greek Christian who said they are true. This concept of the logos of the Word predates Christianity. And it's almost identical to the statements of Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jew who was involved in Greek philosophy. And even this doesn't technically prove what the Christians are saying. Because if you look at Greek philosophy, the logos of the word was still dependent upon God. In, in all of Greek philosophy, they understood it like this, that the logos and the word, well, although he was with God, but he was still dependent on God. So it doesn't even prove that Jesus is divine. It doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit. And this is just the words of a random uh, you know, a person, Greek philosopher living there, there's no reason to accept it whatsoever. It's not mentioned in any of the other Gospels. It's not the words of Jesus. So it doesn't really hold any weight in that sense. There is a whole discussion on the actual Greek being used and the word God. So if you look here, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
So if you look at the actual Greek word, it's slightly different for both the prefix and whatever. There's a whole discussion into that, but I wouldn't advise anyone to go into that because uh, it just gets you deeper. Into, we don't know Greek. We're not Greek speakers. We're going to be talking to a Christian who maybe knows Greek. It's not going to help you out in any way. So don't get involved in that. And many people have made uh, many mistakes when trying to translate a Greek passage. So don't even get involved in that. This is the answer that you should be giving. Then the last proof, and maybe we'll just stop here, is where they speak about Jesus accepting worship. This is a very important one. So if you look in Matthew now, uh, chapter 28, verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, an easy response would be to say that these stories after the resurrection and the accounts of what happened are contradictory. So it's one easy response is to say all these things of where they worshipped Jesus happened after the resurrection, and the Gospels are completely contradictory in what happened after the resurrection, so we can't trust them anyway. Right? That would be one response we could give. However, there is an instance of this worship which appears in Matthew 14.33 when though it says, Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Right? Now, we need to understand this properly. So if you open the dictionary here, yeah, we can just use the dictionary. This is the one that's on the Christian website. This word to worship, it, if you read the actual, so they've translated it as to worship. The actual dictionary meaning is to fawn or couch to to prostrate oneself in homage, so basically to show respect. Now, for us, Alhamdulillah, you know, when Islam came, it came with complete tawheed, to cut off any possibility of worshipping anyone else. But think about the story of Yusuf السلام, in the Quran, that he had a dream that the stars and the sun and the moon would be worshipping him, and they would bow down to him. And this dream came true when his uh, father, mother, and his brothers all bowed down to him. So in early, in previous Shari'as, the mere act of you know, uh, uh, you know, bowing down in res uh, in, out of respect wasn't an act of worship. It wasn't something that was completely prohibited. Even if you look at certain ahadith, there are, there's quite a few ahadith, like, okay, sorry, two or three, where certain sahaba from other cultures came, they accepted Islam, and they told Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we want to bow down to you, how the people there bow down to their kings. Now, they, now they didn't mean they want to commit shirk, they meant they wanted to show respect. So even up till the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in other cultures, this was just a normal way of showing respect. This was how you show respect to people. And even in the Gospels, if you look at the beginning, people came from the East, these, uh, these people from the East came and they came and they showed respect to Jesus by worshipping Him, the same word, by showing respect in that sense. So this word doesn't have anything to do with actual worship and taking someone to be divine. We need to understand that sometimes it's a bit of a shock to us because the way we have been trained, Alhamdulillah, you know, in Islam that you do not bow down to any human being. You know, we've been trained like that, and that is the, the, the haq, you know, the proper way that it should be. But in earlier cultures, in earlier times, in earlier sharias, it wasn't necessary if you look at how, uh, you know, uh, the angels were ordered to prostrate before Adam alayhi salam. Doesn't mean they were worshipping him, doesn't mean they were taking him to be divine. It was a way of showing respect. Or they say they were bowing to Adam, but uh, as the qibla, but it was for, 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 for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to understand this concept here that sometimes Christians will use the sea, they worshipped him, so he was God. It doesn't mean that. The, the actual word means to show respect, to pay homage, to so, so this kind of thing. So it's got nothing to do with worship. Now we're going to leave looking at it scripturally and we're going to look at it historically. So we've already started with that when we saw that Paul didn't equate Jesus with the Father. That means that they were not equal according to him. So even he didn't have the orthodox belief of the Trinity. And now we're going to go further into this when we look at the quotes from church fathers. So just an introduction into this. So in Islam, we have the concept of the Salaf, the Salaf al-Salihin. And it's very comforting for us when we see that our beliefs line up with their beliefs exactly. So when it comes to Tawheed, when it comes to Risala, when it comes to Ba'ath, when it comes to, you know, Taqdeer and all of these beliefs, our beliefs line up 100% with the Salaf. Yet, Scholars coming later on explained those beliefs, gave different ways of expressing them. So the, the scholars coming later on would explain how perhaps taqdeer worked, different theories and that. But the belief in and of itself remained exactly the same when it comes to Islam. Between those coming after and the, the scholars from the earliest period, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad, Imam Malik, all of the early Salaf, the beliefs don't differ one bit. Yes, maybe the mode of expression could differ, but the belief itself never differs. Now in Christianity, as we will see, the actual core beliefs were different. So after quoting these church fathers, we would want to know, were all those church fathers who had these incorrect beliefs, were they even true Christians according to you? So, you know, they, they look up to these church fathers. 
How come no one knew the truth of the Trinity right till the 4th century? So these early church fathers were great scholars. They learned from the disciples of the disciples of the disciples of the disciples. So why is it that their belief differs from the orthodox belief of Christianity? Where did this new information come from? So in the, in the notes, I've got quotes from many, many of the early church fathers. Here I just maybe mentioned about two or three. So Clement of Rome, who died in the year 99, that's very early on, he is known as the first apostolic father and he replaced Peter as bishop of Rome. Now in his letter to the Corinthians, he says the following, which clearly shows that the son is lesser than the father. So he says, the creator and father of all the worlds, the most holy, alone knows their amount and their father. So he says, the father alone knows. Meaning, he is talking about the father, he's not talking about God, he's saying the father alone knows. In chapter 59 of the same letter, he says, let all the nations know that you are God alone. You are God alone and Jesus is your son. Clearly, clearly making a difference between the father who is God alone and the son. So here we can see an example of an early Christian who all Christians look up to who did not have the orthodox belief of the Trinity. If you look at the Bishop Polycarp, he is known to, he's known to be a student, a student of the Apostle John. Obviously, these sort of things are very difficult to confirm. And his letter to the Philippians, he says, But may the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. So he's clearly here stating, these are the earliest Christians that all Christians today accept. He's clearly saying that the God and Father of Jesus Christ. And this is not something that uh, aligns with Orthodox Trinitarian beliefs. Thank mm -hmm. you.